Today I'm here to continue a dialogue that I started when I was in Amman, Jordan and brought home with me to the place I currently live, Lexington, Kentucky. And this is a dialogue about what happens when we as human beings cross these borders that we've created. So yesterday I heard one of my fellow delegates, delegates joking that Churchill must have sneezed when he drew the borders of Jordan. And as arbitrary as these borders seem to us, we can't ignore the very important role that they play in shaping our identity and also in determining what places on this map we are allowed to call home. This is a picture of my home. I grew up on a very small farm in a very small city called Monclova, Ohio. Last year, for the first time, I crossed an international border. I went to Amman, Jordan, and this experience of crossing borders for me was so exciting. I realized I could pick up, I could move, and I could make another place on this earth feel a little bit like home. While I was in Jordan, though, I worked with a group of people who had a very different experience crossing borders. Um, these are people whose rights are literally defined and indeed often limited by the decision they make to take, well, not really a decision, I guess, but the circumstances that drive them to take that step across an international border. And these individuals, of course, are refugees. Something interesting was happening while I was working in Jordan, and this was that Syrian refugees were beginning to cross the northern border and they were bringing with them extremely fascinating and moving and terrifying stories of the home they left behind. Also at this time, there was a really interesting political push and pull as authorities called Syrians guests and humanitarian organizations lobbied for them to be called refugees. So what difference does this one word make? Well, hypothetically, Refugees inherently have rights, while guests do not. So this is something I became really interested in, and I decided to talk about it for an Arabic speaking test at the University of Jordan, and I received a bit of a wake-up call at this time. So about five minutes into my presentation on refugees, my Jordanian professor looked up from her notebook and said to me, the only solution is for all of them to return to their own countries, war-torn or not. She said, they take all of our opportunities here in Jordan, and they aren't loyal to Jordan. So I really hit a nerve for her. And 30 minutes later, I was, she was still talking about refugees, and I was still standing kind of terrified behind the podium, trying to figure out um, how to construct some form of argument with the Arabic vocabulary of roughly a two-year-old. <laughs> so. But my professor's words really inspired me to start listening and dialoguing with people about what discourses we create, often dichotomized discourses, about refugees in our communities. And that's why my question today is, where do refugees fit into the dialogue surrounding a changing Arab world? So I want to start by talking about why I think this question is so important to address right now. So when we think of the Arab Spring, we think of deposed dictators and changing constitutions, but a lot of people don't think about the fact that refugees are also a part of the legacy of the Arab Spring. This cartoon by the political cartoonist Shafat illustrates some of the issues that we face. So, Around the world, there's this great enthusiasm at the prospect of a democratic Middle East, but it declines sharply when it comes to figuring out how to deal with the issue of forced migration. Meanwhile, um, the global economic recession has created a really tough environment for multiculturalism, both in Europe and the United States. Um, I want to share with you, to illustrate this, a really brief 
campaign ad from Sweden that was banned in 2010, so obviously before the Arab Spring. It's not in English or Arabic, but I personally don't think you need to speak this language to understand the message. Well, I'm just going to continue since that didn't play, but basically I'll just summarize what happens. So th there's a picture of an old um, Swedish woman, an old Swedish white woman walking, and she's suddenly chased by a herd of burqa-clad women. So the message he here is uh, politicians are really using fear. They're really capitalizing on fear, on this issue of immigration and forced migration. Meanwhile, in the Arab world, there are 11 countries that are still not party to the 1951 Convention relating to the status of refugees, which is the fundamental document of international law um, used to advocate for refugee rights. So it's really clear to me that we are facing a challenge on leadership when it comes to forced migration. Um, so now that we kind of understand a little bit more about this problem, I want to talk about what one organization in Tennessee is doing about it, what I plan to do about it, and what I would like all of you to do about it. Um, this is a picture taken by the organization Sport for Peace. And one thing I really love about this picture is right off the bat, it defies what most of us would expect to see if I told you I was going to show you a picture of an Iraqi refugee child. The organization Sport for Peace uses um, sport-based service learning to advocate for the self-articulated needs of refugees. And I really love this word, self-articulated needs of refugees. Um, so by using sports, they, they also challenge the stereotypes that people in East Tennessee have toward refugee populations, and they aim to build social capital. Social capital is a really crucial concept in this issue. It refers to the ability of refugees to build relationships of trust and cooperation in their communities. Um, improving social capital is crucially important to refugee rights because it allows, ref it combats a, what is a perennial issue in many refugee communities, which is isolation. And it also provides refugees with an opportunity to um, improve their economic situation. So based on the model of Sport for Peace, um, I decided to this spring to begin a service learning initiative at my university, the University of Kentucky. And I envisioned this uh, to connect University of Kentucky professors and students to refugee children in Lexington and the ministries that serve them. And in doing so, I hope to both address the needs of Iraqi refugees who have a, a very low social capital in Lexington, and also to combat the stereotypes people have towards refugees in our community. The way that I envision it, because I'm very passionate about the intersection between art and social movements, is as an art-based service learning program. So I would like to use playback theater to prompt dialogue between refugees and students. And what playback theater is, is basically where people in the audience volunteer their stories, and then they participate in interpreting these stories on stage. And this is a technique that I witnessed um, while I was working with the students of the Freedom Theater in Janine in the West Bank of Palestine. So, no matter the method, whether you're using sports, um, whether you're using theater, the goal of service learning is to recognize the refugees in our communities and to reach out and incorporate them into our community support systems. Um, so finally, what do I want all of you to do about this? So, Everyone in this room, I know, is passionate about reaching across borders. I think we've really seen that in the last couple of days. And I think that a lot of us live close to refugee communities and we don't even realize it. So what I would ask you to do is to become a part of this dialogue. Start to challenge those dichotomized discourses where we see refugees as either helpless, pitiable victims or dangerous burdens that are weighing down our society. So we really need to start listening to their stories and becoming a part of a culture of human rights, advocating for human rights from the ground up um, instead of trying to legislate it from the top down. 
So I really urge all of you, and I know that I can count on all of you, to reach across borders, whether they are the ones on this map or the ones in people's minds. Thank you so much.